chances are you started your IB career, you kind of chilling, you know, the last two years, but you're putting in the work, it feels good, you're a junior, and then first year ends and you kind of get like the feel of it, you know, the exams are no joke, but you know, vacation comes and you're back to walking straight again. <laughs> then some time passes and you start getting really stressed out <coughs> because you realize, oh my God, this isn't like in three more months. <coughs> you start studying really hard. The the exam is about like two weeks away. You start kind of like scrunching up. You start freaking out. Oh my God, what's going on? You try to keep a straight face. You, you, you know the line. Just smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. And then you're kind of freaking out. You don't know what's going on. And you stumble upon this video. Now, it might have been for a great amount of reasons. But I'm willing to bet it was probably your teacher just been, being like, uh, guys, you know, we ain't gonna be able to cover all the units, so you gotta study on your own, and good luck on the IB exams, alright? See you, see you later. So all your friends just start freaking the fuck out, and there's more than one guy with this look on their face, and we're going like, okay, we need to find something that'll help us out. Kowalski, progress report. We have barely any time left, and to be honest, I still don't understand fucking trigonometry. Right. Now you might be watching this video to make sure that you get that 6 or 7, or you might be watching this video just to try and survive. Whichever is the case, I am sure this video will be of great benefit to you. And without further ado, these are the top t tips and tricks I have learned while starting this course and also teaching it to others. By the most part, when you are facing any kind of IB problem, um, if it has parts to it, for example, A, B, and C, to answer B, you most likely need something from A, and to answer C, you most likely need something from B. This is a perfect example of that. To find the radius, R of the circular base of the cone, you only need the information that was given to you in the problem. But to find the slant height L of the cone in the same flip and formula, you actually need R, and to find the curve fit surface area of the, of the cone, you actually need L. And so this is a great example of sometimes people approach a problem, they're not sure how to get A, and so they say, mm, if I can't get A, I'm going to go look at B. And then they spend hours and hours of time looking at B, or looking at C, given that they can't solve A, and it's just a waste of time because you won't be able to, because you literally need parts A to do it. A much better way to approach this is that if you feel like you literally can't respond it, just leave it on the side, come back later, and make sure to first do A, for it will probably be what you need for the following parts anyway. In fact, if we look at the mark scheme of this same problem, we see that in the first part, sure, we find the radius, which is this value over here, and we see how this value is applied in part B, and the value that you get for part B which is this one right here, the 8.714, is, is applied for part C, and the 3.4, which we formed for part A, is also applied over here. So this is a very clear example that you need part A first before being able to do any of the other parts. And this is also a good pointer of if you are lost on what to do with part B, you have a frame of reference, you have part A. What did I do in part A, and how is it useful for part B? You're going to see that in a lot of these mark schemes, there's these things that say follow through from part A or follow through for parts A and B or etc. This goes to show that you can have your entire test with the wrong answer, but with the right process and you will probably get a four and I would be willing to bet maybe a five in the IB exam. This is because process is very important for the IB and even if you follow through with, for example, part A, if you get a negative value for R, like if you somehow put a negative sign here end up with negative 3.45 and you do everything with a negative radius even though it doesn't make sense, if you follow the process, the guys that grade you are obligated to give you points for following through the process. So all I'm really saying here is that the process is extremely important, not only for understanding the approach, but also literally for getting more points. If you know that you have a wrong value for R because you're getting a negative value for radius and it doesn't make sense, but you cannot get any other value because you're stressed during the test or whatever, just follow through with it. 
follow through with it and get as many points as you can. There is literally no reason not to. Of course, this is assuming that you're low on time and don't have time to double check. But it is a nice plan B that does indeed give you more points than not putting anything at all. Looking at the same mark scheme again, we can see that the IB accepts answers in terms of decimals to the three significant values that is like their holy remark, but not everyone understands significant values or for how far they should go or etc. What I suggest is that you always work with what the calculator gives you. Just put the whole damn number with all the goddamn decimals and make sure you get that additional point of not rounding incorrectly. If you feel good about rounding, then you know you do you, but in the test, it can get a little bit weird, it can be confusing, and writing the whole number and making sure you get that extra point can make the difference. Also, units are always going to be a very big deal. As we can see in all of these answers, we have centimeters, centimeters, and down here, centimeters squared because it's from reference to area. So the main point here is make sure you, you put the whole number with all its decimal points and the units to make sure you get full credit. The formula booklet is literally a fountain of knowledge that often gets overlooked. Whenever you're studying for a test or doing your homework, make sure you have this open and right next to you and get familiar with it. The day of the test, you're going to walk in with just about four things. You're going to walk off with a pencil. You're going to walk in with a calculator and you're going to walk in with the formula booklet and you're going to walk in with all the strength and efforts and blood and tears that have been shed studying for this two year goddamn long process. So, get familiar with the formula booklet. No one knows the area of a triangle, trapezium, circle, circumference of a circle by memory, or the coordinates of a midpoint of a line, or a great additional amount of things. This is why it's good to get familiar with it, with what its symbols mean, to feel more ready for the test. Also, you never know if the formula booklet has what you're looking for. Not a lot of people know what interquartile range is, and when they see it in the test, they get really confused. But really, it's just Q3 minus Q1. And the formula booklet has it for you very conveniently. You never know what this might be hiding and what it could teach you. Also, like I said earlier, most of the times you need part A to be able to solve part B, but it also isn't always like that. It usually is in the scenarios of perhaps geometric problems, I mean geometry problems, but maybe it isn't the case, for example, compound interest problems, where you can do part A and part B individually. So this, is mo this tip is more about getting the feel of when and where you need part A to be able to solve part B and to know if you're wasting your time or not. Either way, your plan should be to solve first part A and then go through with part B. But if you're running out of time and you want to answer something rather than leave it blank, you can always look at part B's and see if they're slightly easier than part A's, even though it is usually not that way, but it is always worth double checking. This is a much quicker tip. If you're in your calculator and you press the button mode, which is right next to second, and you see here that we have um, a bunch of different settings and we, we need to make sure that we click degree instead of radian. This is because if I have radian and I am working with, let's say your sine function and you put sine of 45, we get a set value, right? But if we go and switch from radian to degree and we put the same goddamn number, we're going to see that our, our answer is vastly different. So just make sure that you have your mode in degrees because at the IB Masters level, we only work with degrees and not radians. You will always have to do paper one before paper two. That being said, if in paper one, they don't ask something, then it will probably show up in paper two. For example, the one that I had to take, May 2017, um, paper one, Thursday afternoon, blah, blah, blah. All throughout it, in paper one, there wasn't a single question that had anything to do with derivatives. And of course, with that knowledge, I know that for part two, I am going to have 
I mean, sorry, for paper tool, I will have a derivatives problem, which was indeed the last one in part 6di. All right. So that is just a quick tip that, oh, well, and in part 8 too. And so that is just a quick tip that whatever they didn't ask in paper one, it's probably going to show up in paper two. So might as well take the night to study those things specifically. And for my second to last tip, it's basically just make sure you have a really clear process of how you solve things, which is certainly a synonym for how you approach problems. For example, here for this trigonometry problem, I always suggest that you first use sine rule before going to cosine rule, because the cosine rule, to my judgment, is much more complicated than the sine rule. Or let's say for or let's say for compound in interest problems, you write down all the variables. If it, one of the variables is on the exponent, you use perhaps the calc intercept trick. It's just knowing about what you should do when facing a problem. I swear, if you know how to start each problem, you're way better off than if you know the tips and tricks for the second part of the problem or the third part of the problem. If you can start a problem, you will get way farther and get way more points than the guy that knows the tips and tricks for the last part of the problem. So that is just about being able to write something for the beginning of the problem for part A. And through that, you will certainly get the rest of them as well. So this tip is more about making a sellout to my channel. I always explain math problems through, more importantly, the process. Most of the times I approach, let's say, trigonometry problems through the same uh, perspective, same angle. <laughs> Sorry for the pun. But um, that's the whole idea, you know, understanding things intuitively, understanding the process and applying the same approach always is a surefire win. The IB usually does not try to trick you. I mean, it does, but it usually doesn't. It usually rewards the player that is able to have a good and solid approach and process. Now on to my conclusion and the last tip of this video. For tip number one, it is suggested that usually the, the math studies problems follow a, a logical order where in order to solve part B, you first need to solve part A and that it's usually not worth it to spend time being stuck on part B when you still haven't even attempted part A. Tip number two is that you need to follow through with everything that you've done. If perhaps you know that your answer is incorrect because you have a negative value and it doesn't make sense or vice versa, follow through anyway. The IB grades half of it for having it correct and the other half is for having a really good process. Tip number three is that usually it's part of the mark scheme that you need to put your units and following that to have the correct amount of significant figures. If you aren't sure how to work out the significant figures part, I strongly suggest that you just put in the whole number, including all its decimal places, and avoid that whole headache um, in one go. Tip number four is to get familiar with the formula booklet. It's one of the tools you're going to walk in into the day of the exam. And honestly, usually when you're lost, you should open up the formula booklet, open up to the page where the problem is that, and see if there's any function that can help you. Tip number five differs a little bit from tip number one, but it's, a speci it's basically being flexible, knowing that Hey, if you never got through part A and you have and you're running out of time, take a quick glance at, at part B. Maybe you know how to do part B and not part A. But the whole point of this is to manage your time correctly. And that is another additional tip. Do the problems that you know best first. Be efficient with your time. Only do the hard ones, the ones that you don't understand later on. You don't have to answer the whole test to have a good grade, but you do have to answer solidly and that comes with a strong process and reliable tools which is tip number eight that we'll touch upon later moving on to tip number six quickly with the calculator make sure that your mode is on degrees and not radians also make sure you have batteries with your calculator tip number seven you will do paper one before paper two so if something was not asked in paper one it will probably show up on paper two tip number eight as i said before is just having a strong process and reliable tools to be able to start problems gives you a much better chance at finishing them. It's all about how you approach them and getting familiar with its functions. And that also has to do with getting familiar with the formula booklet and the tools that it gives you. And tip number nine, which is the last one, drum roll please.
it's really just believing yourself. Like, whichever point in time in which you are watching this video, it is fair to assume that you haven't done the A-B tests yet. You might have it in 30 minutes. You might have it in 8 hours. Tomorrow. You might have it in a couple of months. In over a year. And no matter what, in whichever stage you are at, you have put in work and effort. You have had sleepless nights and you have had to sacrifice other things in order to pull through with your IAs, study, etc. And more than anything, it's that you've put in an em enormous amount of effort and you have to let it pay off. You have to let it pay off because these tips are completely complementary to the hard effort and work that you've already put in. The fact that you're watching this video is evidence of that. And I won't say to put away your fears because that is impossible. And I won't say to hide away your pain because nobody can. And I won't say to study until you can't blink because it isn't worth it. But I will say, however, that you need to pull out that courage and confidence and convince yourself that you fucking got this. So let's go, homies. Let's go.